why don't we um, start with just maybe we do a um, introduction call. So maybe we, if we can just go around the screen, not around the room, and if each one of you can just share with us about your role, what it entails, and how did you get started? And I can just pick, or we can go by, um, we can go Brandy first, Jennifer, and then Wilmarie, if that works for everyone. I'm just going by the, the session <laughs> promo image. <clears throat> you can tell who's the like non-tech expert in the room because I had to immediately like switch computers because my video wasn't popping up. So hopefully it's like working now. Um, but hi everyone, my name is Brandy Collins Dexter. Um, I, my affiliations right now are, I'm a, a fellow, um, a visiting fellow at the Shorenstein Center um, out of the Harvard Kennedy Business School and also a senior fellow at an organization called Color of Change, which is a racial justice organization, but I'm, I'm actually in the middle of writing a book right now. So that's, that's the huge focus of the work. Um, for 10 years, I've been doing racial justice work, and I, I just want to acknowledge that today is um, the anniversary of the murder of George Floyd, and it, it really is like a potent reminder that it's crucial that we're all empowered to tell our own story and have access to all the tools at our disposal to challenge the various barriers that are mounted to equity. So I didn't come by tech, honestly. Um, I, I spent 10 years doing racial justice work, but I'm a lawyer by trade. And um, I started off doing work around job opportunities for people with criminal records and really starting to look at what were the policies that were barriers to people being able to obtain jobs. And one of the things that we learned and understood at my organization was that it wasn't just the policies, but it was the perception, the perception of black people. So there were a lot of studies that show that like, for example, black and Latino um, men who apply for a job are like, whether or not they have a criminal record, significantly less likely to get a callback for a job interview and more likely to be perceived as a, as a criminal. And, and so doing that work took me down the rabbit hole of looking at media, and then it took me into this like new tech space. And so 10 years later, more than 10 years at this point, um, we're really immersed in this like tech environment that reinforces those certain biases that we see playing off um, offline. So we've seen um, folks like Latanya Sweeney who have released studies talking about that a black sounding name being Googled is more likely to pull up an ad next to it um, that says, does this person have a criminal record which may trigger to somebody's mind that they do whether or not they do. We've seen Sophia Noble talk about some of the things that come up in Google searches I myself have experience when you Google black women um, or black girls that you're more likely to see, you know, pornographic hits, um, whether or not porn or pornography is in that search functionality. And so when you see all of those different things playing out and you see in the digital economy, discriminatory marketing practices um, that, are, that are so lucrative, um, that whole companies and industries have sprung up around them. And we see the ways that low-income communities are targeted by predatory payday loans and a, and a number of other things and the ways the algorithms work to reinforce that. Um, I see a lot of my work more as a means to an end. I love technology, but really it's about putting the power in our own hands to be able to really fight for healthy economies, a healthy future, and a healthy experience on and offline for all of us. Amen. Um, Jen, would you like to go first? Uh, go next. Hi, all, and thank you, Mia, and thank you to my wonderful co-panelists. Um, I'm Jen Lee. Uh, I'm the Tech and Liberty Manager at the ACLU of Washington, and I began working at the ACLU about two and a half years ago. And um, prior to joining the ACLU, I had actually done a lot of public health advocacy. And that was kind of my foray into technology. Um, I was really interested in bioethics and the intersection of technology and healthcare. And as I delved deeper into tech ethics and tech policy, I learned more about the history of surveillance and became really interested in advocating for approaches to create community-centric technology policies. Um, I studied public policy in grad school and did a Google fellowship shortly after. And um, during this time, I deeply felt 
and experience the tech optimism that starts with the assumption that technology will save us all. Um, and you know, this assumption uh, is spread without centering the voices of people who have been and continue to be deeply harmed by technologies. Um, so I knew I wanted to be advocating for strong protections against these powerful technologies and really holding technologies accountable to people and to the people who have always been disproportionately impacted. Um, so I landed at the ACLU of Washington and with my wonderful team, I've mostly been working on drafting and advocating for tech policies at both the state and local levels. Thank you, Jennifer, for joining us. And can we also have Elmari, do you mind sharing your role and how you got started? Absolutely. Thank you, Mia. Thank you for inviting us, for hosting this event, and as well to my fellow uh, co-panelists. Um, so the way that I got into this role, uh, it's kind of a story way back when, about seven years ago, I was fresh out of college at the summer before law school. And um, I was working two jobs, one of them, which was as a content moderator. Now, back then, uh, this, was, this job was actually called a social media evaluator role. So I got to witness firsthand what graphic, pornographic, violent, um, harmful content was being posted on these platforms uh, seven years ago. And uh, as a psych major, I was extremely interested in the intersection of technology, of psychology, and its impacts on society. Um, that really uh, evolved from there. Um, while I was in law school, I was, I focused heavily on IP, on tech, on privacy. I took every possible course I could, served as a research assistant, focusing on social justice issues revolving tech and IP. And then I was selected as a Google Policy Fellow. So from there, it really just kind of hit the ground running. Um, I worked as a uh, Excuse me, during the Google Policy Fellow, I worked as a fellow for public knowledge. Um, some folks are familiar with them. And prior to Access Now, I was the Director of Policy and Government Affairs for the National Hispanic Media Coalition. Um, in my current role at Access Now, I'm a policy analyst. I'm also a law lawyer by trade. I graduated from the Howard University School of Law. And so by design, I am a social engineer. That is something that we, um, that we often quote. Uh, you're either a parasite to community or your social engineer. So I take that, um, I take that very uh, to heart in the sense of tech and, and, and advocating for marginalized communities, for low income communities, um, and uh, just for <laughs> being Afro Latina, Black, Latino, Indigenous communities as well. In my current role, um, very similar to what Jen does, I or Jen Lee does, excuse me, um, we advocate for tech and for tech policies on the state and local level. And um, my job really is to influence um, and raise public awareness on these issues, whether it's conducting research, analyzing current policies, and speaking with different um, offices uh, on the Hill, and really evaluating the effects of different proposed legislations and their reports. Okay, thank you all so much for sharing your backgrounds. It, it shouldn't be uh, surprising to anyone why you're here today, uh, given your depth and breadth of experience in the space. So uh, maybe I'll just start with you, Will Murray, because you went last. So maybe, uh, if you can just talk a little bit more about uh, what is, um, you're with Access Now, like what is Access Now's approach to uh, creating a more diverse and ethical future? Absolutely. Um, so for those who aren't familiar with my organization, we are a international human rights org. And our goal really is to um, expand and protect digital rights for users across the globe. So our approach to um, artificial intelligence, it's very human rights focused. Um, we, it's our positions are based on human rights rather than ethics, ethics because there's really there there's an international human rights framework that's more useful for this conversation. Um, we believe that systems AI systems should be designed, developed, and deployed in a way that respects human rights, diversity, and autonomy of individuals, and that they really shouldn't exacerbate harm or adversely affect human beings in any way whatsoever. 
So fortunately, momentum is building now behind human rights as a foundation for the AI debate, right? And um, it's important to know that human rights can complement the existing ethics initiatives. These rights are universal and binding and more clearly defined than ethical principles. Um, so I hope that I can I can talk a lot more, but I know I have um, I know I have room to. So I'm going to kind of just stop there. Um, I can get into our positions later. Um, you know and and uh the work we've done because a lot of our work has um we've been man we've made monumental strides in the eu um so love to talk about that but i will stop there i don't like to ramble no you're too kind absolutely um we will also um let's talk to uh jen uh jen do you prefer jennifer or jen you can call me jen okay. <laughs> thanks for asking <laughs> Uh, so, Jen, what is ACLE's approach? Does it complement or is it similar to Access Now's approach? Uh, and you're very active in the space, uh, especially you're with ACLE Washington. Love to hear more about your approach. Yeah, of course. Um, so we're the American Civil Liberties Union. So um, a lot of our work is based on protecting people's civil liberties and civil rights. And um, the overall objective of doing our tech and liberty work is to protect people's rights in the face of new and powerful technologies and to really make technology accountable to people and to uh, particularly to the people and communities that have always been disproportionately affected by surveillance. Um, so to do that work, um, a big part of our work is convening a group called the Tech Equity Coalition. Um, otherwise known as tech or TC. Um, and it's same, it aims to center the voices of um, communities who have been disproportionately harmed. And this coalition is composed primarily of local organizations in Washington working intersectionally to advance racial and social justice. Um, beyond these organizations that are involved in the TC, the coalition also includes individuals who are privacy advocates, technologists, artists, and researchers who all bring tremendous value to our collective advocacy. Um, and uh, now we've grown the coalition to over 80 organizations and individuals. And together we've done some really amazing uh, work together. Um, the coalition has testified both in our state legislature and in city and county councils, uh, drafted letters and op-eds, hosted webinars and workshops and contributed to the development of bills, um, toolkits and so much more. Um, and uh, something I think is really important about the work we do in coalition is that we emphasize that the harms caused by surveillance, privacy invasions, and unchecked technologies are neither new nor surprising. And in our conversations with lawmakers, we emphasize that at its core, surveillance has been and will always be about power and control. Um, so a big focus of, of um, how we talk about technology is asking the questions about who has the power to watch and police whom, with what tools and for what purpose, who is affected and who is not, and who gets to define terms like cost and benefit. And it really goes towards um, questioning the assumption that I mentioned earlier that tech is our panacea um, and that tech provides more benefits and costs. So just redefining these terms from a different lens. I love how you reframed that. And I have to also, I just remembered uh, how I um, came across ACLE Washington. Um, it's through John Pincus, who's I, I believe is, has also joined us today. He's extremely active. And this is where I love our male allies and accomplices who introduce us to uh, just amazing women and non-binary non folks um, for helping us. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think Peaks are here too. There you go. Oh my gosh. You have a fan club going here, Jan. So, uh, so thank you. <laughs> thanks again for all that you do. I feel like being with organizations like ACLE, you don't feel alone just because the work you do, you bring everybody together because you feel like it's daunting. In face of adversity, we have like these giant companies. Um, so being part of an organization, which is just brings together all these amazing individuals and organizations, one feels more optimistic that there is a way to sway um, some of these unethical practices that we see out there, surveillance being a big one. So that said, um, going on to Brandy, um, your lighting looks great. You're looking awesome. <laughs> it looks like you have figured it out. 
<laughs> Lovely. Um, so can, I, can you share more about your approach? I know, you, uh, congratulations on your upcoming book. Would love to hear about what is your approach? Like, what are you recommending in terms of uh, creating a more ethical um, endeavors tech future? Yeah, I'm so I'm trying to wear like all the hats so I can represent my different affiliations. But like I, I first got into this work um, really at an organization called uh, Media Justice, then called the Center for Media Justice. And um, it was my first time really understanding that it wasn't just about the representation or the content that we see on online, but like who owns the pipes, who owns like our access to information, um, who may be surveilling us, um, as Jen mentioned, for like public, you know, means working with law enforcement or for private means in order to, um, you know, uh, really be able to target us for, for, for various marketing practices. And so I started doing this work um, really at the FCC, at the Federal Communications Commission and expanding out to the Federal Trade Commission to really talking about like, what is the role of federal regulatory agencies in this new internet that's being built up in such a quick period of time. And I moved to Color of Change. And, and the interesting thing about Color of Change to me is that it is in a lot of ways a startup. Um, it was started in, in Oakland by somebody that was at a tech company. We move really fast, we move um, really rapidly at that organization. And we started off doing the work around diversification of Silicon Valley. So interviewing a number of different people that were working in different positions in Silicon Valley to really get a sense of what was the landscape and what were we seeing. And through that work, um, it became really clear to us that we had a number of different fights, right? So there's one, the continued dis diversification, who's in these roles matter. Um, and we don't necessarily just talk about diversification for diverse sake, because, you know, Color of Change is a racial justice organization focused on Black communities, but being Black in a certain position of power doesn't necessarily mean that racial justice is served, right? It, it's more about um, both the diversity of experience and, and um, goals brought to the table, but also like what type of internet are we trying to create? What type of internet are we, you know, looking to fight for? And there's all of these people, there's this long history of tech pioneers that are people of color, that are women of color that have built this internet. And yet we often get left, left out of that story. And so it was about telling the story of what the internet was and could be and how it was used. It's about fighting for all of the ways in which big tech companies are beginning to enter into the space and make our world and our experience smaller online. So as we get pushed into various filter bubbles, how that fractures our abilities to kind of like see each other, to be able to work together, um, how that replicates models of discrimination within those various filter bubbles and circulate a series of harmful tropes and understanding of, of our society. Um, and also to think more broadly about um, what does an accountable ethical internet experience look like. And so that was the work at Color of Change and now, it, and, and we did a lot of testimony um, and did a lot of state-based work as well, but at Shurenstein, that's a nonpartisan um, institution. And so again, we're looking at this broad question of society and democracy through media technology um, and how we uh, tell this like story of what are the dangers of the internet and what are the opportunities of the internet. And so through that has been spending a lot of time releasing a number of different reports, looking at everything from like disinformation and the degradation of the information economy um, to looking a little bit at um, uh, things like deep fakes and a number of different sort of products of like AI and development and that that work feels like it's it's constantly ongoing. But I think what I appreciate about this panel and the continued work is that we have to not look at it in a in a bubble or, or in a vacuum of technology, but in this broader context of what society are we fighting for? Like what are we working towards and what does that look like? Very well said. And like 
a plus hundred to everything that he said. Um, it, representation matters, and you're right. It's not just about just diversity is meaningless if you're just going to use a person and prop them up to just uphold the same status quo. Um, so one thing is clear from everything you shared: AI ethics is a very broad space, and we talk about ethical implications, whether it's surveillance or whether it is um, online um, algorithmic. The, bi the sexist and racist bias that are built in algorithmic systems. Um, and folks are talking about um, environmental impact. So it's all of that about, and which is why it's so important that the work you're doing, it addresses all these different dimensions in a way that we take back power as civil society, um, we, that it, it, it's more human centric, not just as a cliche, but it's really designed with humans in mind. Um, so that said, I have a question uh, for you, Valmari, if you can uh, talk a little bit more about um, what do you think um, from your perspective and Access Now's perspective, what is the role of civil society in this discussion? Uh, and I also am very curious about what led to Access Now's uh, resignation from um, partnership on AI, because that's where uh, the press release that you put out caught my attention. So I'm so glad you're here, here today because I'd love to learn more about that and I'm sure our audience would as well. Absolutely. Um, so I love what you just said, Mia, we take back power. And I just, I wanna start with that. Um, to give you a little bit of background and give you an example of how we, how Access Now has contributed to the discourse and kind of get into it a little bit. So we, we were founded, um, after the contested Iranian presidential election in 2009, right? So during the protests that followed that election, um, we disseminated video footage with, which came out in Iran. We campaigned against internet shutdowns, online censorship, um, government surveillance. And in addition to that, or, sorry, I'm, a, I'm not going to lie, I'm a little nervous. Um, so let me just relax, all right? So. So um, that's how Access Now started, right? That, that, that was the catalyst. And we've continued to do that type of work. Um, one thing that Access Now does, uh, one of our, um, I guess, how we defend and extend the digital rights of users around the world is um, we have this really cool 24 seven digital security helpline. So we actually provide real time technical assistance for users at risk, civil society groups, activists, journalists, human rights defenders, when there's a government shutdown in any other country, folks can call in and, and inform us about it. We keep track of it. Um, we have helpline offices in Tunis, Manila, Costa Rica. So we work closely with global partners. We do policy and advocacy work, which you've already heard of. And um, we actually provide grants to grassroots orgs and activist groups that are working with communities firsthand. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit later too, but we also have, we convene thousands of experts from around the world for this really amazing events called RightsCon. Um, and we really get to talk about these issues at the intersection of human rights and tech. So that's kind of giving you, um, illustrating a, a picture of what we do. And if you ask me, you know, what, what is our role in this? It's number one, we can help governments and companies avoid the mistakes that we've already seen and that have been documented. Um, we're in a position to speak up about the issues of bias and the issues that impact marginalized communities, low income communities from, uh, Brand, Brandy mentioned this earlier, from the question of what type of connectivity we want in the tech policy debate to the AI debate, um, data protection minimization, who should own our data and how, um, what, uh, Met, excuse me, what um, transparency and accountability um, that should be enforced among companies. So um, we, we um, have the opportunity to really address these issues and ensure um, that uh, automated systems in the future are transparent and all of everything I just mentioned. Um, and, and that's it. <laughs> Sorry, again, I'm a little nervous. So. Uh yeah. We wouldn't have guessed if you hadn't told us. You don't come across as nervous at all. You're doing okay. great. Okay. Um, you. Can you tell us a little bit about like what then led to uh, your resignation? Yeah, sorry. Um, so uh, PAI, um, what, we appreciated the opportunity to be a part of the forum and contribute to the different con 
uh, conversations there, but ultimately we realized that it wasn't helpful. It wasn't a helpful forum for us to advance our priorities on um, artificial intelligence and um, automated decision making. So I, I really want to stress that this isn't a rebuke of multi-staker forums in general because we absolutely believe they're necessary. This one just didn't al align with our priorities. It's just that there's so many powerful players out there and I uh, respect to the stance that you took that there needs to be a bigger role for civil society and more emphasis on human rights. So I uh, appreciate that um, and thank you for sharing. So uh, let's talk a little bit to, to you, Jennifer. So um, can we talk, uh, you mentioned the tech equity group and you mentioned there are 60 organizations. Just so you know, um, we are trying to be part of that organization and see how we can best support you. That's something we're working on. So Jen, can you talk a little bit more, which are the other groups that you're working with and um, any specific technologies that you are uh, working on? Um, unethical technologies or surveillance technologies that you're working on addressing right now. Sure, yeah. And um, yeah, it's so good to be connected with you. Um, so thank you, John, for connecting us. Um, uh, so as I mentioned, the Tech Equity Coalition is comprised largely of organizations, but also it's all comprised of individuals. Um, and some of the organizations within the coalition include um, La Resistencia, American Muslim Empowerment Network, API Chaya, Black Lives Matter Seattle King County, Densho, Indivisible, and uh, many more uh, organizations that are local to Washington. Um, but we've also worked with national groups such as Consumer Federation of America, Media Justice, Fight for the Future, EFF, and, and others in our um, data privacy and face recognition fights, especially because these fights are not um, not confined to just Washington state. Um, a lot of our work here and the work in other states, they connect and what we do here impacts folks in different states, um, folks in other countries, as a matter of fact. And we, um, so there's a lot of both local and national collaboration at play. Um, but I um, definitely also wanna highlight that we worked with academics um, within the Tech Equity Coalition, like the Covalence Collective and the Critical Platform Studies Group to build toolkits like the Algorithmic Accountability Toolkit, which um, Peaks mentioned, and the Watching the Watchers Toolkit, which aims to build community power um, and really elevate the voices of community members as the experts on technologies. Um, and um, we are in a period of uh, growth with the coalition, we definitely, I mean, the coalition's aim is to always uplift the voices of marginalized communities. Um, and, and we really uh, are working hard to make sure that space is intentionally that way. Um, so I work with a brilliant organizer, Savannah Sly within our organization. And um, we've been really brainstorming on ways to continue to build power and the reach of our coalition while um, maintaining our, our aims and values in that way. Um, so if folks would like to get involved or would just like to learn more, um, definitely feel free to email us. Um, I think somebody dropped the link to the Tech Equity Coalition page in the chat. So please check it out and um, yeah, just get involved. <laughs> Uh, yes, we'll be sharing a bunch of links and we do have some of them and John has been amazing. He He's literally the glue that holds everybody together. Sometimes I feel he's the bridge between all these organizations and the great work that you all do and um, this group. So we're very grateful to him for that. So we have some moderators uh, in the chat and we do have links to um, some of the work that you're doing. So we'll post this shortly. Um, so thank you, Jennifer. Um, and I did want to mention, Bill Murray, that I am actually doing a lightning talk at the RightsCon uh, and on the topic of um, the in defense of non-experts and lived experiences. So uh, I'm super excited. It's my first time. So thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, looking Very forward to it. Um, so Brandy, uh, the way I found you was um, I came across a video um, where you have, um, it was about dismantling unethical business models and one specific um, platform that came to mind, you mentioned was uh, Facebook. So let's talk about Facebook a little bit more and um, can you talk to us more about as a civil rights advocate, what are some of the harms from 
like just there are so many, <laughs> maybe you can distill it down to what are the key harms with platforms like Facebook and what are some ways we could start dismantling some of those unethical practices? Yeah, um, so I'll talk about Facebook and I'll broaden it out. So like, I think that, um, I, I believe it was Jen maybe, or someone earlier that was saying like, we started off in this place of, of hope for these tech platforms and, and what they could mean um, for our communities. And I know in the past, I even used terms like digital oxygen to describe the ways in which we've been able to organize on places like Facebook and Twitter um, to give name, voice, and face to those that have been killed by police violence to really challenge stories and predominant mainstream narratives. Um, one of the things that we've really seen over the last couple of years is, um, well, let me back it up. I mean, we could debate whether or not Facebook ever, um, you know, started from this benevolent place. Like, I think as, as far as I know, it was originally like a ranking hot girls site at Harvard that had all of these problems and was already being challenged by the Black and Latina um, Student Association on the campus. But to the extent of what we've seen over the last few years and shifts in business models that are really focused on um, things like advertising and um, really like polarization for clicks or, or um, really doubling down on the um, sort of histrionics environment, the kind of toxic environment that the internet can, can provide and really creating those um, petri dishes within tech platforms. Um, when it comes to Facebook, it's like, what, what are we not concerned about? Um, I couldn't even begin to quantify the amount of damage um, that Facebook has done globally to a number of different communities. It's been a direct threat to democracy in so many places. It's been a tool of genocide. It's been a tool of, of censorship and, and silencing of advocates. Um, and we've seen even in you know elections in the United States, a number of ways in which they've tampered. I think people have been lulled into this like sense of security, false sense of security because they felt like the outcome of the 2016 election um, was fair. And it, 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 we, we have to always keep saying there were a number of different problems, a number of uh, attempts to, you know, float disinformation and, uh, you know, a number of chaos. And immediately after the election, of course, we had January 6th. And so um, as far as Facebook goes, we've, we've seen a number of different things. Um, we've seen Facebook and other tech companies not just be complacent, but eager partners with law enforcement agencies. Um, they've rolled out the red carpet for third party data mining um, that allows companies to build tools to track and monitor activists. Um, Facebook turned off Karen Gaines Facebook Live at the urging of law enforcement in Baltimore a few years ago before they broke into her home and gunned her down in front of her son. Um, Peter Thiel, who um, built his CIA-funded data mining company, Palantir, for the purposes of collecting information on tracking and surveilling distant voices, occupies the Facebook um, board and has a, a flow of money through several tech companies, and um, was also an early investor in Clearview AI, a facial recognition company with ties to white nationalism. And um, in the case of Amazon, that's another company that, that we look for. I actually was in Seattle um, not so long ago, or I guess a few years at this point, meeting um, with um, senior counsel there um, with ACLU, NorCal, and a large swath of groups representing a number of constituencies, sharing a number of stories that elevated the ways in which the company's technology, um, particularly facial recognition technology, has harmed communities in myriad ways, ranging from silencing speech to breaking up families to facilitating domestic violence. And we pushed them on that. And at the time they were not willing to take um, their facial recognition off, off the market, despite many ethical, moral, and extra legal issues. Um, last year, under pressure, they, they finally put a moratorium on it. And I'm happy to say that I think more recently, um, they put a, a permanent moratorium on their re recognition technology, but that still doesn't stop Ring and all of the other um, you know, surveillance tools that are still flowing into our community. And so as, as long as we have business practices that um, and we leave it to the companies to ground their practices based on like what's good for business, what's good for power, for as long as we continue to have, a, you know, money in politics is a problem. As long as we continue to not have antitrust regulation that can open up the universe of potential businesses, um, they will continue to perpetuate, uh, you know, a number of harms, even with the sort of well-intentioned people that may work there. And so those are, those are just some of the different concerns that, that we've seen and that I've tracked in my work. 
I can't wait to read your book, Brandy. That is so comprehensive and that's st stunning. Okay, thank you. You there's so much to um, you covered a lot of ground there, and um, it just because also the platform does have a broad broad ranging consequences and in so many different ways. So two things. One is uh, when I um, Again, at the risk of dating myself, when I started in Silicon Valley, Facebook was a new kid on the block. Nobody cared who they were. And there was this, um, so I, I used to go to a lot of meetup groups right in the uh, Palo Alto area where all the VCs would get gathered together, all the entrepreneurs would get in a room. And this person, uh, one of the VCs, uh, he's now a VC, but he was an up and coming, amazing person, community, uh, bringing the community together, Vinnie Gloria. And he said, guys, do you see what Facebook is doing? They're building the largest advertising platform. And it was a shock. And today it seems so intuitive. At that time, nobody saw it coming. People just thought, oh, it's a way of connecting things. So he saw it, uh, people saw it coming. Peter Thiel is an interesting one because he has never been a fan of um, free speech. Um, I'm sure uh, if you want to look him up, do Peter Thiel and Gawker news, you'll see how he managed to put them out of business. Uh, he funds a lot of surveillance technologies, whether it's Palantir, uh, Facebook, Clearview AI, um, you've listed them all. He's also a big supporter of Trump, who also wasn't a big fan of uh, the, the past administration, wasn't a big fan of human rights, as you all know. Um, so it's interesting when you see people's values and what motivates them, and then when they fund these technologies, their values are flowing into those technologies, and it's clear. What those values are monetizing suppression of human rights uh, free speech and so on uh, so that brings me back to you will marie um, would love your thoughts on um uh, we talk about human rights and it's so fashionable to talk about human rights in those other countries and here we are right we're all in the united states we've just been through what like it's not even been like six months since the insurrection in our own country um, th something that we, if this had happened in some other country, we would have been all over it, right? We would have said, oh, we would have denounced it and so on. And, and uh, six months, barely six months later, we've not done much about it. So my question is really, um, what kind of uh, are you, uh, harms are you seeing to human rights issues right here at home? Um, and uh, how, what are some ways that um, we are, you or your organization are, are recommending? How do we address that? Absolutely, Mia. Um, wow. Uh, flashback to the insurrection, not fun. Um, so to answer your question, um, AI, AI has created all these new forms of oppression, and in many cases, it disproportionately affects the most powerful and the most vulnerable. We often hear about the right to non-discrimination, you know, but that's not the only human right that's implicated by AI. Um, human rights are interrelated. They're interdependent. So AI affects nearly every internationally recognized human right. Um, the right to, of, we've often heard so many organizations talking about the right to free, freedom of movement and assembly and the chilling effects that facial recognition technology has on protests. But I wanna share some things that folks might not be thinking about. So the right to education. You know, AI can fundamentally violate the principle of equal access. There are universities in the US that are using deterministic algorithmic systems to recommend what applicants they should admit, who's worthy essentially. And they're custom built to meet the preferences that these universities have, and they can have a host of issues that lead to discrimination. We know that many elite universities have historically been attended, attended by, help, by wealthy white males. And so many issues arise when you're using this type of data um, and that you're, using these, this data that at risk perpetuating these past trends. Um, most of these systems will probably deploy or continue to employ machine learning in the future, which can make bias harder to detect. This could result in universities discriminating under the guise of objectivity. And if, on the other hand, if AI is used to track and predict students, uh, student performance, because that's a thing now, um, in a way that limits the eligibility to study certain subjects or have access to certain educational opportunities, the right to education is put at risk once again. Um, when you think of the right to marry, 
children's rights and families' rights. If AI technology is used for health and reproductive screening, and some people are found to be unlikely to have children, screening could prevent them um, from marrying or from marrying a certain person if the couple is deemed unlikely to conceive. So similar, similarly, AI-powered DNA and genetics testing could be used in efforts to produce children with only desired qualities. Um, and lastly, uh, the right to life, liberty, security, and the right to a fair trial. Um, criminal risk assessment software, it's being pegged as a tool to assist judges in their sentencing decisions. Um, this has been going on for a while now, right? But when you're rating a defendant as high or low risk of reoffending, you're attributing a level of guilt, which can interfere with the presumption of innocence required in a fair trial. And we all know that black and brown people are disproportionately in prison right now. So if you're using these tools, you're perpetuating this injustice. Um, right to privacy, data protection, we know that privacy is a fundamental right, it's essential to human dignity. And the right to privacy reinforces other rights, the right to freedom and expression and association, like I mentioned, um, in regards to federal recognition technology uh, used in protests. So th there are so many human rights issues going on all around us. And unless you're looking at it from a human rights lens, you may not catch those things, right? Um, so th those are just a few, a few issues that we're facing now. I mean, of course, we, we know that um, AI tech can't recognize people of color the same that it does white folks. So that's, I mean, that's not news to us either. Um, but I do implore folks to kind of think about these human rights impacts um, that AI has and uh, to, yeah, to, to um, just kind of keep doing doing the good work. The framing that you provided is spot on. That's exactly how we should be thinking about these things. And we never hear this perspective, uh, except in very limited circles, because uh, the technology, the tech industry is run by white men. And for them to consider what a person of color or woman of color um, or communities of color are facing, it, it, it's, it's something that doesn't occur to them because they haven't experienced it. And again, that's reflected in the technologies that develop and that the technologies they're peddling. So this just you just highlight about why this is so critical that we include these voices and um, in the right conversations, also the framing should be with human rights centric rather than uh, having a conversation about the technology, which is very, uh, very, um, the tech-centric uh, serves, doesn't, it only serves the purpose of the tech industry. It doesn't serve the purpose of humanity. Uh, so that said, I would love to ask, um, Jen Lee, you've, uh, Jen, you've been so, um, effective. I feel like everything that you've been working on, um, ACLU Washington has been working on um, when it comes to countering some of the legislation that's coming up and such. Could you share like what's active right now? What's on your radar? What kind of uh, proposals are out there? What are you seeing? And where are you most active in terms of countering, um, specifically technologies and legislations related to it? Sure thing. So right now, um, a big thing on our radar is um, we're working on passing the first countywide facial recognition ban in the US. Um, the ordinance that we are advocating for would ban government acquisition and use of facial recognition technology in King County, which is the largest county in Washington state. And it's also home to the headquarters of both Microsoft and Amazon, big tech giants. Um, and last week, we had our first vote in the Committee of the Whole and King County Council members actually voted unanimously in favor of the ban. And we would not have gotten here without the tremendous advocacy of the Tech Equity Coalition. Um, our final vote is next Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific. And we're continuing to advocate for council members to stick true to their vote and pass this ordinance and ban government use of facial recognition in King County because it is a uh, extremely racially biased technology that, that is a tool of um, police power and police violence. So we're working on getting this through. So that's a big thing on our agenda right now. Um, but on the state level, we're also working to pass at the very least a moratorium or a temporary ban on government use of face recognition technology. Um, and two other key pieces of legislation we worked on in the 2021 session, and we hope to continue working on in future sessions is um, data privacy legislation and automated decision-making system legislation. So 
uh, in, in the 2021 session, we worked really closely with the Tech Equity Coalition to draft and advocate for the People's Privacy Act, which is a piece of legislation that would empower people to truly control their information and hold companies accountable when they violate um, people's rights. Um, we put this piece of legislation forward um, proactively, but also as a, as a way to push back against big tech-sponsored data privacy legislation. Um, and I'm really uh, happy and proud to share that we actually managed to defeat a, uh, an industry-backed, really weak privacy bill for the third year in a row. Um, and we were really concerned about this piece of legislation because we saw um, similar legislation, almost verbatim legislation popping up in other states. And we were really wanting to send a strong message that we are not going to settle for the status quo. We really need to push, move the Overton window on what's possible for data privacy and protecting people's rights. So we're going to continue advocating for the People's Privacy Act, continue um, pushing against bad privacy proposals, and really, you know, speaking truth to power when it comes to big tech trying to um, make people comfortable with really invasive surveillance practices. And then the last um, big issue we're working on that I mentioned is AI-based automated decision-making systems. We all know that these systems are increasingly affecting our lives. Um, every day, people are denied healthcare, over-policed, kept in jail, passive for jobs because of scores assigned by computers. And sometimes while these systems simply function as calculators, um, and sometimes they just apply complex rules to individual circumstances with results that could be explained or challenged, many times they don't. Um, they're non-transparent and non-accountable. So we're working to pass legislation that would require any government agency using AI-based automated decision-making systems to make decisions about people, um, to make transparent their use of such tools and prohibit government from using these tools to discriminate and give people um, a way to hold government agencies accountable if they discriminate via machines. So this year, that bill that we were pushing forward passed out of the Senate Policy Committee, um, but it didn't make it out of the Fiscal Committee. Um, but we did get a budget proviso passed. So in the interim, we're going to work to shed more light on how systems are being used in Washington State, these AI-based automated decision-making systems. And um, hopefully in the next session, we'll make further progress on banning discrimination by a machine and really not only holding um, these uh, government agencies accountable for using these tools, but also making their use uh, transparent for everyone to be able to scrutinize and um, object to if these, if they are, if these uses are um, problematic. Just listening to you gives me so much hope. I, I think it's fantastic the work you're doing. And I know it's not easy. It's a lot of brutal, backbreaking work. You're constantly having to stay on top of these because uh, three years in a row, uh, that's something, you know, <laughs> staying <laughs> those forces um, out there who are trying to lobby so hard, the big tech forces, which are they, they have a massive army of lobbying. They're always constantly pushing these and you as uh, your organization is a counterweight to them. Uh, it's just, again, it fills me with hope and optimism that um, help. I, I hopefully also helps us all sleep better at night. So I appreciate all that you do. Uh, and thank you for sharing that. So um, we only have about five more minutes. So I'd like to wrap it up with one last question for all of you. One is, uh, Brandy, if you can talk to um, about how do you introduce diverse voices into um, the online conversations? You had talked about creating these spaces um, for Black voices and such. Um, could you share a little bit more on that? Oh. Um, I think that, well, I want to back up and say a little more on the, on the, on the government piece and then I'll wrap it up really quickly. But I think that, um, one of the things that I've, I've seen play out in the work is that it's almost like a plain offense on the like sort of local and state level and a certain amount of defense that has to be played on the state, on the federal level. And I don't think that's true all the time, but where we see is the most innovative policies are getting passed on the local level or getting passed on the state level. You see a lot around like facial recognition, different things getting passed in places like Oakland. You see, you know, stuff moving in Washington state, stuff happening in Illinois and New York. And then oftentimes then what you see is this like federal conversation moving around like passing something that would undo 
everything that's that's happening and they kind of wave out this like dream privacy bill but it seems like it can't we can't get it over the finish line so i i think again it i really love the, these points that folks are making about the work and the organizing that has to exist on the local level to be innovative to incentivize innovation to not allow tech companies to go into Congress and go into other places and say that innovation will be crippled by the sorts of policies that we're advocating and for and pushing, which they do by making the argument that the only way to open up opportunity for diverse entrepreneurship, for diverse capital, for diverse opportunities for folks is actually to have you know, more regulation around uh, these different blurry spots to really push the government to take more of a central role as it has in past decades around encouraging innovation and investing in tech and investing in um, understanding more around the tech landscape so that when a Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos or another person gets pulled into testimony, they're actually getting asked these like probing questions. And we actually see the FTC in power to do in a and I trust work. So that's some of the things that I, I would say are important about re like really elevating these diverse um, you know, voices and spaces. And then also like continuing to push these companies because we all know the speed at which legislation moves and it, not very quickly. So I don't think we need to leave a seat at the table like some of the work that ACLU Washington and other folks have done around getting Amazon to move on recognition, like that was something that was going to move faster than legislation ever would. And so we have to push them to do things like, um, I love the idea of algorithmic rewards or, you know, hiring practices or other, other, other ways in which I think we can be in, innovative around ensuring a more diverse Silicon Valley and ensuring more diverse venture capital, as long as we don't leave the government stuff by the wayside. That was a great point. I, I, I Until you mentioned it, I was not even making the connection. There is at a federal level the work that happens in the local level, um, which is why the work that ACLU and other organizations are doing is so critical because uh, that's where the real battles happen. So I appreciate that. So uh, maybe, we'll, um, well, Marie, do you want to help us wrap this up by um, just sharing some of the critical policy work that you're more focused on right now? I'm muted, sorry. <laughs> yes, I'd love to. Um, so we are, we've been working on a, a number of things. Um, there, keep on your radar, there's going to, we've worked with the Coalition of Civil Society Organizations, and we're going to be pushing um, a call for a ban of federal recognition technology that enables mass and discriminatory discriminatory targeted surveillance. Um, we've seen innocent victims be arrested, not just in the US, but in Argentina and Brazil. And this has undermined people's rights to privacy and their right to due process and freedom of movement. Um, we've seen ethnic and religious minorities uh, oppressed in communities in China, Thailand, and Italy. So this is very important to us. Um, and um, keep an eye out for that. I'm trying, I know that we're on a time limit, so I'm trying to go quickly. We recently published a report on data minimization. It's called uh, Data Minimization, Keys to Protecting Privacy and Reducing Harm. And in that, we explore the ways to combat the types of abuses um, by limiting the amount of information that's collected online. And there's a section um, in that report that contains um, uh, use uses um, and really just a thoughtful way that data minimization could be tailored to build better machine learning systems. Um, you know, race-based data has been used to undermine communities, black and black people's health, character, and rights equal opportunity in the U.S. And in the absence of any type of comprehensive law protecting people from exploit um, ex exploitative data collection, the communities that we're in, these marginalized communities um, of color, we're going to continue to suffer the consequences of algorithmic racism. So, um, we're we've also recently um, I wouldn't say recently, but we've done work on how AI systems undermine LGBTQ identity, and we launched a campaign, the All Out Campaign. Um, it's a global campaign, and it exposes the threat of automated gender recognition in AI systems to predict sexual orientation. Our message is really simple. You know, our, these systems are dangerous for LGBTQ people around the world, and they should be banned. Um, I'll be sharing a link for folks who want to um, learn more about that. Um, and we also have right, uh, RightsCon um, coming up. It's one of the biggest summits um, on human rights in the digital age. Um, we 
gather thousands of business leaders, human rights defenders. This year, we're expecting 10,000 participants over 400 sessions. And there are going to be a lot of sessions on AI, um, specifically some that can just I had noted uh, bias and algorithmic decision making, perspectives and approaches. Um, the Consumer Reports is going to be hosting the regulatory solutions to AI infringement on civil rights if folks are interested. So I'm happy to share that. Um, and um, oh. yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we're also part of the Reclaim Your Face campaign. That's um, it's a European campaign for the legal ban of harmful facial recognition and related biometric mass surveillance. Um, and um, yeah, we've done a lot of other work in the EU. Um, we developed and published uh, the Toronto Declaration on Protecting Rights to Quality and Non-Discrimination in Machine Learning. That was actually one of our first efforts in bringing human rights to the AI debate. Um, so we, yeah. <laughs> It's phenomenal. I'm just always blown away how much you all get done. I understand, like, I mean, this is important work. And again, you just filled me with so much hope and optimism that there are you're the reason we sleep better at night, all the work that you're all doing. Um, so um, I just do want to, first of all, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for joining us.